Hello everybody, I'm Professor Crimsy and welcome to our 10th Clip Studio Paint tutorial. Wait, 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 what is this? Hmm, okay. So, in today's class, I will teach you everything you need to know about gradient maps and how effective this feature is for quickly and efficiently coloring and editing grayscale illustrations. We definitely got a lot to cover for this feature alone, so without further ado, let's begin the ritual. The gradient map is a feature you can find in Clip Studio Paint by going to the top menu, Layer, New Correction Layer, Gradient Map. You may also select any of your layers or folders, right-click it, go to New Correction Layer, and create your gradient map from there for the same result. As the gradient map window opens, a new correction layer along with a white layer mask will automatically be created on top of the layer that was previously selected. The cool thing about correction layers is that they are non-destructive. This means that even if you press OK and apply these settings to your art, you can always go back to the correction layer, double-click it, and reopen the gradient map window to make new changes to it. It's also good to note that you can access gradient maps through the Edit menu, but I personally don't ever use this method because instead of creating a correction layer, it just applies your gradient map effect to your layer and you can no longer edit the result after. So let's forget about that one. Alright, so once your gradient map is created, you should immediately notice a change in the tones of your artwork. For instance here, mine got visibly darker. This is because the gradient map window offers an instant preview of our current settings and how they affect my artwork in real time. So let's cut to the chase. What makes the gradient map feature so worth learning about? Well, there are a plethora of reasons, but the short answer is speed and versatility. To put it simply, with the use of this gradient bar right here at the top, you can essentially reassign entirely new color values to all the values already present in your canvas. For example, you could say, I don't want my liner to be black anymore, I want it to be dark blue instead. So you go to the very first little arrow node at the darkest level of the gradient bar, then you go to that color box here, and you pick a dark blue color. And just like that, all the black areas in your artwork will now have their values changed to dark blue. And you can do this for every tonal value in your artwork. This feature basically allows you to do as many color iterations to your art as you want at the click of a button. You could use this to color manga pages, create quick color variations in your concept art, experiment with the mood of a piece before committing to colors, add a color filter to a piece that's already finished, or completely change its mood altogether. And of course, as we will be covering today, you can entirely color a grayscale artwork from scratch only using gradient maps. But before we dive into all that, let's first go over the gradient map window and all of its settings to better understand how to set up and manage your gradient maps. First, right at the top, we have our gradient bar. This gives us a preview of our gradient currently being used. Each little arrow below it, also called a node, represents a color value in your gradient, which is displayed in the color box here once you select it. These nodes can be moved to any position along the bar and new nodes can be created simply by clicking along the increments below the bar. To delete a node, simply click the trash can icon or click and drag the node out of the gradient bar like this. You can also invert the value of your gradient by clicking on the flip icon here. All your gradients must have a minimum of two nodes, but as far as I know, you can create as many nodes as the bar can fit, though personally, five or six is the maximum I ever find myself using. Another important thing to mention about the gradient bar is the few rules you should keep in mind when selecting the colors for your gradient. The default bar goes from black to white, and so does the values of gray in your artwork. It is very important to understand the notion of tones and values when working with gradient maps, because the colors you choose and where you position them on the gradient bar must follow a certain logic in order to look good. For example, your notes color should go from dark to light in values to maintain the authenticity of your own artwork's values. You should also probably aim to pick colors that are close in hue to each other. Those usually make for the best color combinations in a gradient. Lastly, you should try to choose colors with a similar amount of saturation to make the blending between the nodes appear more natural. So really, having a basic understanding of color theory, color properties, and color spaces is as important as understanding tones and values when it comes to gradient maps because every color has a grayscale equivalent and sometimes you will want to pick a color that fits a specific tone, but depending on the color space you are using for your selection, you might find it hard to maintain that tone when making adjustments to the hue and saturation of your color. Let's quickly demonstrate this on these six squares. Three squares will represent the HSV color space, and three squares will represent the HLS color space. To access your color space, you must go into the color settings window by double-clicking on your main color icon, 
As you can see, HSV stands for U, Saturation and Value, and HLS stands for U, Luminosity and Saturation. And both have exactly the same amount of colors, but without going into too many details, they mostly differ in the way they display said colors. Right now, all of our squares are filled with a neutral gray tone. So let's go into our color settings window and make sure we are on the HSV color space. And let's put our saturation to 50 and press OK. Now, let's select the pixels of our gray square and use the shortcut Alt plus Delete to fill our second square with our current color. Next, let's do the same, but this time we will put our saturation at 100. When this is done, let's repeat the same steps, but this time in the HLS color space. We will keep our U at 0 and our luminosity at 50 all the way through and only change our amount of saturation to 50 and 100. Right away, you can see that these colors are very different. And if you go to the top menu, layer, new correction layer, and select U saturation and luminosity, and you remove all the saturation from our colors, you will realize that the top squares, even after maintaining the same value, technically, all have different tones now, while the bottom squares kept their tone consistent all the way through. To put it simply, this happens because of the order in which the color spaces prioritize their color properties. In the HSV space, U is at the top, saturation comes second, and value comes last. In the HLS space, U is also at the top, but luminosity comes second, and saturation comes last. It's probably a lot more complex than the way I'm summarizing it, but this is how I personally dumb it down to make it easier for me to remember, so that's the tip I'm gonna give you too. And believe me, this is very pertinent information to know when it comes to working with gradient maps. Going back to our gradient map window, on the bottom right corner is the mixing rate curve. This curve and its control points define the type of gradation that will happen between a node and its neighbor node to the right. As is, this S curve creates the smoothest possible gradation between the nodes. But you can create many other types of gradient simply by dragging around its control points, creating new ones by clicking along the curve, and removing them by dragging them out of the graph. Next, we have our active gradient set. Gradient sets are basically folders that contain a group of gradients. By going to this drop-down menu here, you can access all of your gradient sets, be it the ones that are by default in Clip Studio Paint, the ones that you have made yourself, or the ones that you have obtained through the Clip Studio Asset Store. To use one, simply double-click on it, or select it and click on the Load to Gradient Bar icon here at the bottom, and voila! It's as easy as that! At this point, it is good to note that if you play around with the nodes of these gradients, this will not override their default settings. Even if you completely change the nodes of a gradient, the moment you switch to a different gradient, all of its settings will reset back to default. To permanently change the settings of a gradient, you need to click on the Replace Saved Gradient icon down here. Though, be mindful that if you change those settings, there is no going back once you press OK on that window. So the better thing to do actually is to make a copy of the gradient you want to play with by selecting it and going to the Duplicate Selected Gradient icon here. Give it a name and override the settings of that one instead. In the eventuality where you made changes to one of the original gradients by mistake, or that you created a brand new gradient out of a pre-made one, and you want to keep the result, go to the Create New Gradient icon right here, give it a name, and press OK. This will create an entirely new gradient from the settings you were using without affecting the one it was initially based on. You can also transfer a gradient from one set to the next using this method. Simply double-click a gradient, change sets, and click on the Create New Gradient icon. And there you go! To delete a gradient, simply go to the trash can icon, but again, be careful because when you do this, there is no going back. Lastly, to reorganize the gradients in your sets, just use the arrows on the side here. By the way, all of these actions we just went through are also accessible by right-clicking on the gradients themselves, and in this menu you also get the extra option to rename your gradients. Oh, and one more important thing to know. If you want to save all of the changes you have made to your gradients and your sets, you have to press OK on the gradient map window at the end. See this window as kind of like its very own work session. If you exit the window or if you press cancel, all the changes you have made while working in that session will be lost. The good news is that it also means that if you delete a gradient by accident, you can press cancel and when you reopen the gradient window, it will be right back to where it was prior to deleting it. So this covers pretty much how to manage gradients individually, but if you want to manage the gradient sets themselves, you have to go to this little wrench icon here, and this will open a drop-down menu with some new options specific to our sets. For instance, we can create a new empty set and give it a name. We can also delete sets we no longer want. We can make copies of our sets and also rename them to anything we want. 
Below that, we can register a set as a material. This is something you must do if you want to share your own custom gradient sets to the Clip Studio Asset Store, for instance. Oh, and talking of the Asset Store, I highly recommend everyone watching this video to go pay a visit to the Asset Store and browse through the hundreds of community-made gradient sets on there. Some require Clippy points or gold to be downloaded, but a lot of them are also free and just as good. So save yourself some work and go download as many as you like. When there's one that catches your interest, simply click on it, press the download button, and go back to your artwork canvas. Gradient maps work differently than tools, so unlike brushes, they cannot be dragged and dropped next to our other gradient tools. To use your downloaded gradient maps, you must go back to the gradient map window, back to the wrench icon drop-down menu, and click on Add Gradient Set. This will automatically recognize the gradients from your download folder and let you choose which one to add to your gradient library. Then, simply click the Add button and you will see your gradient map window update to show all of your new gradients in one set. Don't forget to press OK at the end, of course, and that's it for the gradient map window settings. Alright, now we can finally move on to the practical chapter of this tutorial, which is to create a fully colored illustration out of a grayscale artwork. If I can give you one tip when it comes to creating a grayscale illustration, it's to keep a wide range of values between the darkest and lightest areas of your image. This also means avoiding the use of pure black and pure white as much as possible because those two tones offer no wiggle room to play with since they represent the extremes of our tonal range. This is important because the more range you will have within your artwork and the more range your gradient map will be able to use in return. If you cannot tell if the values in your art have a good range or not, a good tip I can give you is to head over to the top menu, layer, new correction layer, select posterization and input the value of 6. 6 is the maximum amount of nodes I usually put in my gradients, so this will basically dumb my artwork down to its 6 main tones and show me what they are. As you can see here, my tones distinctly go from dark grey in the shadows to light grey in the highlights, and even simplified like this, the depth in my shading is pretty easy to read. If you do this, but end up with too many light or dark values, or if the greys in your art do not stand clearly apart from each other, then it is time to either punch the contrast of your piece with the brightness contrast correction layer, which is also in the correction layer submenu, or go back to the drawing board and redefine the shadows and the light areas a bit better. So, once we are happy with the values of our grayscale artwork, it's finally time to start our coloring process. And really, applying gradient maps to our artwork is by far the easiest and fastest step in this video. You create a new gradient map on top of one of your folders, let's start with a skin here for example, and you can either clip your gradient map to it now or you can do it after you're done creating your gradient. This is the point where, if you don't have your artwork separated into folders like these, you can use the layer mask attached to our correction layer to isolate the areas of your artwork that you want the gradient map to apply to. And this process is super easy. Simply choose any type of saturated gradient, it really doesn't matter which one at this point, and press OK. Then select your layer mask, hit the delete button on your keyboard, grab a pen brush or a soft brush and start applying pure white to your mask layer. Another tool I like to use because it's a bit faster is the lasso tool. Simply select the entire area you want to include and use the shortcut Alt plus delete on your keyboard to fill in the white. Then all that's left to do is to create the gradients for our gradient maps. And since all the theory has already been covered regarding the gradient bar and how to properly pick our colors, we can skip straight to just doing that. Typically, the way I approach any gradient is by first choosing what the darkest and lightest values are going to be, and then I just experiment from there. And this is the gist of making gradients, really. You experiment a lot, you add a color nodes here and there, and you move them around, adjust their values and saturation, and through trial and error, you end up with a result that you really like. If you really want to target a specific tone in your art, a good tip is to hide your gradient map, color pick that gray tone, and look where its position is on the grayscale. Then go back to your gradient map, create a node at the equivalent position on your gradient bar, go to the color picker, and click on your main color icon to get the same gray value you want to assign your color to. Lastly, switch your color space to HLS, as we went over earlier, and from this point, you can choose any hue and amount of saturation that you want, and your gray tone will always remain at the same value. See how practical that color theory was earlier? Now with this method you can pick colors while staying true to your artwork's values. So anyway, 
Here is what I ended up with for this skin gradient. I went with a dark brown and a light beige at the extremities, and a more saturated dark shade of beige, followed by a slightly saturated lighter shade of beige closer to the middle. I then duplicated that gradient map layer and clipped the copy on the face folder. I also wanted some greenish patches on the skin of my character. She's a zombie after all. So I duplicated the skin gradient map, opened the settings window and went with one of my pre-made green gradients. Next, I deleted the white from the mask, I selected the lasso tool and I started selecting each patch I wanted to turn green. Once that was done, I reduced the opacity of my green layer to fit a bit better the saturation of the skin layer, and that was it. After that, for the hair, I created a more complex gradient that goes from dark blue to green to light yellow. This is in line with the tip I gave earlier that if you choose colors that are close to each other in the color wheel, they always look great together. I then applied the same gradients to the ears, but I also needed a different gradient for the inside of the ears, so I duplicated the green gradient layer and applied the skin gradient to it. And lastly, I removed the fur part of the ears from its layer mask. The cool thing about visiting the Clip Studio Asset Store earlier is that prior to this video, I found this set, which sadly I cannot read, but it is called Pale Gradation on the store, I believe. In that gradient set, I found this really nice gold type of gradient and applied it to the earrings folder. Now, something I have not mentioned before is that sometimes the colors of a pre-made gradient will look great, but they will not fit the tonal value of your original art. Something you can do when that happens is to override the value of the gradient map by going to the gradient layer and putting its blending mode on color. Now, only the color value of my gradient will transfer to the earrings folder, but the tonal value of the earrings themselves will remain unchanged. I tend to use this blending mode the most with gradient maps, because when you work so hard on the values of your grayscale artwork, you don't necessarily want to stray too far from those values, but know that changing your blending mode to color essentially voids the values of your gradients, so it's a case-by-case -case scenario. After that was done, I made separate gradient maps for the eyes, the mouth, and the clothes of my character. I'm only going to show a time lapse of these, considering that we have already covered the basics of this and this video is getting kind of lengthy already. Now, let's not forget the background, of course. I spent a while creating that spiral effect just to get that perfect colored gradient with the lines that seem to go deeper and deeper down. So I really want to put a nice gradient on that. And with that, we are finally done. We have successfully turned a grayscale artwork into a fully colored illustration. And the cool thing about this result is that it is as final as we want it to be. Because at any point in time, we can go back and iterate on the colors of our characters as many times as we want to. So, thank you so so much for sticking around with me through the end. I really hope this video provided some insightful information and tips to help you better understand gradient maps and all the little subtleties and technicalities around them. That will be it for me though, I must return to my crypt for a long and deep slumber. I shall see you again soon, hopefully. Take care everyone, au revoir!